Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Front of Mind Share It digital event hosted by the CMI Southeast Regional Board. My name is Mel, and I'm an events delivery coordinator here at CMI, and I'll shortly be handing over to Steve to begin this evening's event. If you have any questions during the session, you can ask them using the live chat box on the right of your screen, and we shall answer as many as, many as we can. Today's session is being recorded, and it will be shared with you tomorrow for those who have booked to attend, will also be available on the CMI website and CMI YouTube channel. Now over to Steve Duncan, Deputy Chair of the CMI Southeast Regional Board. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mel. Um, good evening and welcome to this, the final uh, instalment of a series on positive psychology uh, delivered by uh, Mr. Dean uh, Bellman. Dean Bellman is a former Royal Air Force Special Forces pilot who has since gone on to serve as Operations Director for Mace Defence International and is also the uh, Managing Director of Value Behaviours and Front of Mind, which is a positive psychology training company. Um, we are extremely grateful for the time that Dean has uh, devoted to this uh, series of events. Um, certainly from the feedback that we've had uh, through the comments, I'd like to say, Dean, it's obvious that there has been a really positive effect and a lot of interest in what you've had to say. Um, and in terms of views, we are we are certainly up above the 5,000 mark now. So, so obviously it's resonating um, with people. Appreciate at the moment, Dean's actually away doing some delivery for the police up in Yorkshire. Um, so we appreciate you making the time and effort to uh, come and help us out tonight. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Steve's absolute pleasure to be here again. Um, I only hope the hotel Wi-Fi holds up and the connectivity stays strong enough. But um, no, thanks. And it's a pleasure to be back here for the, uh, the concluding part of Front of Mind. Fantastic. Um, so, Dino, just for those who kind of um, maybe weren't here at the beginning or those who were here at the beginning, but it has been over a series, could you just give us a a very quick canter over what we've covered so far and what's available in the digital archive for people to look at. For sure. So this is the um, the, the final instalment of a series. Uh, all of the other uh, recordings are available digitally on YouTube, um, on the CMI YouTube channel. So from the very start, we've, we've covered um, Front of Mind as a programme, a positive mental health programme. Um, which breaks down into three component elements. So what we're looking at is uh, all proactive build and prevent strategies and techniques um, for to build positive mental health and to hopefully help prevent some of the more negative conditions that we hear so much about. Um, and the three steps um, that we've covered, and today's the final step, are own it, so to take ownership of our mental health, um, Lots of others can have an influence on it. Some other organizations, people may even have a duty of care to us. We may have a duty of care to them. But fundamentally, the principle of own it is that um, that we the buck stops with us. We own our positive mental health. And it's not what happens to us. It's the way we choose to respond and choose to process those events. And then critically, how we, uh, how we choose to think about them going forward. The second stage is be it. Um, and be it's broken down into two halves, if you like. So be it is all about techniques that we can actively adopt in our daily lives, build into our personal professional routines, um, which enhance our mental health, either by gradually training our brain through this kind of heavy and theory approach of, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. So repeated activities such as daily gratefuls or conscious acts of kindness um, will will fire those neuron sequences on a regular basis and, and we'll become more adept at looking for those things we're grateful for. Also in the be it side of things are force multipliers. So anything we can do to fuel our brain from the essentials such as oxygen, hydration, nutrition, sleep hygiene, through to the other things that can really be, um, be really positive fuel for our brain such as taking time to get out in nature, exercise, engaging with hobbies, relationships, pets, all of these things. And then the final part of Be It is a, is a, a reactive part. It's when we're faced with challenge and adversity and how we can process those events, 
um, and turn to a recovery drill, if you like, a spin recovery when we're feeling in a, in a spin, how we can spin recover, just like a pilot would spin recover an aircraft that went out of control. We can take a breath, regain our conscious logical thinking, reframe the situation, come up with some positive responses and then work out um, how we recall it, become the author and a director. So it's that spin recovery. And then tonight, that brings us to the final stage, which is share it. So own it, be it. And then tonight, we're going to be talking about share it, the, the reason why we should proactively control how we share mental health, positive mental health with others, and the benefits we get from it. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for that, um, Dean. And certainly for myself, I've been trying to employ some of these uh, uh, techniques and tools that you've you've discussed in my own life and in my own working practice since since the course has started um i can see the value of those and and i think you know everyone's quite quite enjoyed working through with them so if we're doing all this good stuff if we're practicing gratitude and we're um doing uh random acts of kindness etc um why then is is sharing it with other people so important and and you know to our ongoing mental health um at a, how many strands to this answer i think you know we, we could take this off in various different avenues but to me there's there's a couple that are the predominant strands that, that we have a responsibility to so um, if someone can take ownership of their mental health and decide that, you know, they have the ultimate responsibility to build and protect their mental health, that's fantastic. If they can then, because they're taking ownership, the smart thing to do is to adopt strategies to assist with that. So they're then taking on board strategies and techniques, building them into their lives. That's brilliant. Um, but even then, once we've got, you know, positive mental health ninjas that we're breeding across the country, across the world, with all of that ownership and those proactive strategies, we are still gonna get blindsided. We are still gonna get adversity, challenge, setback, just creep up behind us and blindside us on some idle Tuesday probably. So, um, you know, we the single biggest predictor of your resilience in the future, no matter how much of an own it and a be it mindset and strategies you have, the single biggest predictor of your resilience and your future success is the strength of your support network. So by taking what we know and what is benefiting us and reaching out to our support network and sharing our positive mental health with others, not only are we getting the benefit of doing something nice for others, not only are they getting the benefit of learning from us and adopting some of these techniques, but we're strengthening our support network. And that will be the thing that counts on the day when you really need it. So, um, yeah, you've used this term support network. So what do you mean by support network and who should we kind of be considering when we think of our support network? A support network can be as broad or as, as narrow as you wish it to be. But if we if the start point for our thinking on this is the day we get blindsided, the day something happens that's just overwhelming us, who who would we want to be there instantly? Who would we want to be there for us, with us? And that's the start point, your inner ring, the inner circle of the support network. Who are those people? And then obviously we can go further and further out in the support network. Who else do we get support from on a daily basis? And for some people that support network isn't just, um, close family members or friends, that will then start extending to uh, social groups that they're a part of, a book club, a cycle group. It could be their church. It could be the Samaritans are part of their support network. When then we can look into our professional lives, the support networks of our colleagues. All of these will have an effect. Um, the key thing in Share It is understanding that we shouldn't leave the strength of our relationships with all of these elements of our support network to chance. Indeed, proactive, um, uh, positive outliers, that is to say, 
positive outliers in the field of positive mental health, people who have strong mental health, not only do they own it and be it, they proactively manage their investment of energy and time and effort with their support network to keep it strong. So a long answer to your question, the support network can be whatever you want it to be. You can have multiple different support networks, but come the day you need help, who would you like to be there in a flash? Right. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing Batman isn't an option. Um, <laughs> so um, I've, we, we've just got a question come in here from Joe on the subject of su support networks, and she's asking, um, do they need to be bi-directional? So do, does the fact that someone is supporting you mean that you have to support them? No, not necessarily, not necessarily at all. I mean, if we look at the concept of um, contracts of kindness or random acts of kindness, um, we try to encourage people in acts of kindness not to want to reciprocate, but to pay it forward, because that's the way to get a greater a greater proliferation of, of, of the good effect. Um, of course, in support networks, there is there's a certain amount of being there for each other, but equally at some points you know you're, you're going to have to you might need assistance from someone else without being able to repay it so a support network shouldn't be transactional there should be an understanding that you want to support each other but at some times the the seesaw the balance can be heavily weighed in one one side to another but the intention will always be there to support each other And just moving on from something you said, you know, you referred to people having the, for instance, the Samaritans. I'm guessing that, you know, other medical professionals, be it your doctor, whatever it may be, where you work or where you live, you know, they might be part of your support network, but obviously without there being any kind of um, reciprocity. Yeah, absolutely. So, Look, way back in Own It, we talked about the idea of it's not what happens to me, it's the way I choose to respond. And that's an incredibly powerful thing. But the ultimate example of owning it is knowing when, how to ask for help. You know, asking for help isn't giving up. Asking for help is refusing to give up. So the investment in the support network isn't just so that it's there when you need it. It's so that you feel comfortable going to it as well. Because if we don't invest in our support networks, we know that it becomes much harder to go and ask for help when we need it. We often recognize and identify we want and need help. But if we haven't built and maintained that support network, then it becomes harder to go and ask for help, be that a friend, a family member, a, a medical professional. Um, and in fact, through really proactive engagement in a support network, what we tend to find is that um, Elements of that support network will be there for you before you ask for help. They start recognizing subtle changes in your behavior, and they'll come and ask, "Are you okay?" They will be okay as a single question. When you say, "Yeah, I'm fine," the code word "fine" for "ask me again in a different way," they'll 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 make sure they understand whether you are okay. But that's what comes from true investment in a support network. Yeah. So we've got a couple of questions here that, that I'll just bring out because it seem relevant at the moment. Another one from Joe. Thank you, Joe. Um, how do we support other people? What should we look out for? Um, firstly, if they if they ask for help, then they've taken a really bold step. As soon as someone asks for help, that's pretty much a drop everything. You know, if you're a genuine part of their support network, if someone has taken the brave and bold step to to ask for help, and that's an immediate okay. It's not a oh, when I've got time. So yeah, let's recognise that. Um, aside from that, um, how do we support other people? We help them to find their way through. Now, sometimes that might be being their absolute bolster and support, but what we're always seeking to do is gradually not take away that support but change the level or the type of support such that that person is finding their own way back through um, because what we're effectively encouraging them and helping them to do is get back to a place where they can own it unsupported 
Um, so yeah, we do whatever we need to do, conscious of the fact we don't become um, a crutch that they are reliant on. Excellent. Cheers for that, uh, Dean. And then we've got a question here from Bob in Andover. Thank you, Bob. What characteristics make a good support person? Wow. Um, it could be anything. It absolutely could be anything. Um, obviously, you can, we can look to the, the, the classic characteristics where we would like to hope that people had a degree of empathy and a degree of compassion. Um, but I think the key characteristic, not just to make a good support person, just to make a good person, is that one word, kindness. You know, if, if, if we can be nothing else, be kind. Um, and that will be the foundation for anything else you might need to do as a support person. Thanks. Um, I've got a question here from, from Mehmet, and it kind of covers, uh, I think, the whole piece. Um, you know, uh, we're all busy, and companies are busy, and we've got all of this going on. You know, time is short, money is short. So what are the rewards reaped from building and sharing better mental health in the workplace? Why should companies be interested in ensuring their people are looked after? Um, okay. Um, this question's from Mehmet, yeah? Yeah. So, Mehmet, that's, um, well, that, that that's the bottom line, really, isn't it? It's, so we've got, we've got a... Um, a financial and economic bottom line and then we've got a humanitarian bottom line so we've got a because it's the right thing to do from a performance aspect of the organization um, and it's the right thing to do from a humanitarian aspect of the organization so let's consider them individually um, negative mental health conditions such as stress anxiety depression four years ago were categorized as overtaking musculoskeletal injury, predominantly backache as the biggest cause of absenteeism from the workplace. Okay, it could well have been before that, but that was a study by mind in 2017. And um, there was no um, study before that that could give it um, the, the equivalent, you know, yes, we know it's changed. But four years ago, we know that it's switched from being backache, MSKI, um, as being the largest cause of absenteeism to being negative mental health conditions. And that doesn't take into account presenteeism, being at work, but not fully present and prepared and able to discharge duties at work and thinking. Why do I say that? Because if you look at the way organizations used to and still do um, work to the challenge of the backache challenge or the MSKI, virtually everything they do from workstation assessments, ergonomic furniture, training for heavy lifting, support structures for lifting, training for workplace, um, correct seating posture. Everything is about prevention. Why is it about prevention? Because prevention is better than cure. <laughs> you know, if we can prevent it happening, then, you know, it's, it's, you know, so much less resource required. And of course, the person doesn't have to experience the debilitating pain of backache. So, 90 plus percent of the focus on M the challenge of MSKI causing absenteeism is focused rightly on preventing MSKI, predominantly back pain. Look now to how a lot of organizations are tackling the challenge of mental health conditions. Um, laudably, we are seeing an increase in mental health first aiders who can signpost. We're seeing an increase in uh, accessible areas for counseling, uh, for treatment, we're seeing a lot of um, it's okay to talk, which is great. What we're not seeing so proactively is um, our strategies that can prevent negative mental health conditions. And the key strategies are those that build. So what benefit does it bring to the workplace? Well, in a bottom line perspective, from the economic financial perspective, it can be hugely performance enhancing and save money if we can prevent the conditions just exactly as we tried in, in, the, in the MSKI element. From the humanitarian aspect, um, if we take the time to invest in others, we feel good, we get a dividend. 
we get a dividend. But as I've said previously, the critical thing is our relationship gets a dividend. It grows a level of trust. You know, we release um, serotonin, oxytocin. We, we increase level of trust in that relationship. Now, if we've got an organization, a uh, work organization or, you know, a sports organization whereby people are encouraged and enabled to share positive mental health with each other, you've got an organization that is consistently building trust in each other. Now, that to me is one of the, the major players in, in an organizational performance is this building of trust. Yeah, and uh, if I could just um, chime in a little bit there from, from myself, I've been uh, revisiting some of Professor Sean Aker's work on on positive psychology. Um, and, you know, he states that in terms of performance, people having a positive mindset, you know, they've measured this using uh, scientific means, generally outperformed by about 30%. Doctors are 18% faster and more accurate in terms of making diagnoses. People are doing high high technical merit stuff are quicker and more accurate um, than those who are in either a neutral or a negative mindset. So, you know, before we get to the stage of stopping people from, from having mental health issues, we're already reaping, you know, potentially a lot of benefits from people just being in a positive psychological state absolutely the, the the very techniques that we share we're talking about sharing are um chemical releasing techniques there, there's you know there's nothing there's no magic involved here this is not a lesson from hogwarts everything that we've derived from positive psychology is science-based and what we're talking about in um positive psychology techniques for positive mental health is not always having a positive mindset that's a large element to some of them it's what we learn from positive outliers and what we learn is that they build in routines techniques into routines and one of the key ones is sharing positive mental health and experiences because that experience those techniques release positive chemicals dopamine oxytocin serotonin endorphin and and the release of these chemicals fuel the areas of the brain that 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 result in the the performance increases that you've just stated you know six professor sean acres in his book the happiness advantage you know on that study they concluded people were six times more creative when they engaged in a positive mental health technique um and happiness advantage technique on a regular basis six times more creative three times more productive mm. i mean that's you know uh incredible but bringing us back to tonight's topic which is this sharing it and this concept of s support networks and you've said you know we, we need to be putting in the work now we need to be uh working on our support network when we don't need it so it's ready for when we do so are there any techniques or tools that we can use so that come that rainy day we know where we should be going uh, absolutely. So, look, you know, in every session, we try to give a, a bit of a, a bit of an experience. And you know, in in own it, we did some box breathing. How can we own the situation best? Well, if we can take time to stop and breathe, then we can process the situation with our logical brain, not our emotional brain or our reptilian brain. So we we did some box breathing, and then as we looked on to be it strategies, we did some conscious acts of kindness, sent positive messages to people who weren't expecting to hear from us. Um, and the benefits that are derived from those those type of engagements. So what I'd like people to do here, I mean, they could actually do it now if they've got a piece of paper and a pen, um, or if not, just grab, grab a piece of paper and a pen and, or a pencil. And um, this is a really, really simple technique. And before we go through the technique, just very quickly, um, why would we do this? It seems a bit kind of, you know, almost too simple. What we're actually going to do is just map a basic support network. Why would we do it? Because what we know from positive outliers, people with strong and consistent levels of high mental health, is that they don't leave their engagement with their support network to chance. They, they you know, it's not a, oh, I haven't spoken to so and so in a while. I must do that and then forget to do it. They have mechanisms for, um, 
just just constantly keeping keeping tabs, keeping a measure on who they're who they're investing time and effort and energy with. Not in a in a sort of calculated way, just in a right, they might need my support, but I might need theirs. So they they control it. So what we could do here is if you just take the piece of paper and put a circle in the middle of the piece of paper, just a small circle, and write your name in it. So your name in the middle of a small circle in the middle of the piece of paper. And then what you can do is put some equal size circles, same size circles around the outside, like a daisy around the outside, maybe six or eight more circles around the outside of that piece of paper. Um, and then what you do is go through each of those circles and give each one a name and identity of key members of your support network. So if this was me doing it, I would have Dean in the middle, I'd have six or eight circles around the outside, and I would then have my two sons, Harry and Joe, in one circle. I would then have my business partner, Jimmy. Um, I would then have my sister, Deborah. I'd then have maybe um, another couple of colleagues, another couple of friends. Steve, you might make the short list, who knows? Um, I, would then have, <laughs> I would then also have um, the, our local community center, uh, in, the, in the village where I live, Tiverton, because we'd, we're a really strong community and especially through through COVID, we looked out for each other. So the community center definitely is part of my support network. And then maybe I'd have the rugby club um, where I coach as part of my support network. Once you've given all of these um, satellite circles, if you will, an identity, what you're going to do now is connect your circle with your name in to each of the satellite circles in turn and make the thickness of the line connecting you to each one, the thickness of the line represents the strength of your relationship with that element of your support network right now. Okay, so the thicker the line, the stronger, the more solid the relationship with that element of your support network. So if we're honest with ourselves, we go around and we say, right, okay, my boys and I, yeah, that's a fairly thick line. Okay, what about... Um, then looking at my business partner, okay, not too bad, we're doing a bit at the moment. What about my sister? Actually, no, haven't spoken to her in a bit. If I'm truly honest, that's probably a very thin line, maybe even a dotted at the moment. And then carrying on round, what about the community? Yeah, that's a nice thick line at the moment, but the rugby club, no, it's been closed. Virtually no line there at the minute. I need to reestablish communications with the support network elements in the rugby club. And once you've done that and gone around and connected your circle to all the outline uh, satellite circles, you can put the pen down and then have a look at what is now one of your support network maps. OK, so this is just an example. You could do this on a greater scale or you could do specific support networks for work to whatever. Perfect. Now's the time to have a look and be honest. Should any of those lines in the ideal world be thicker? And if when you look at those lines, you think, actually, yeah, in the ideal world, some of those lines would be thicker. It might be that one of those lines is too thick. It might be you're over investing time somewhere at a cost to your relationship in other areas of your support network. Either way, you're now taking control of how you assess, you know, how you're going to invest some time and energy and effort in your support network. And then the final thing is turn that map into an action plan. How often do we go to the fridge, realize we need something, go to the shops and forget to buy it? The way we get around this is by writing a list, okay? So turn that map where you've identified what you need into an action plan for how you're going to go about it. So you want a particular line to be thicker, right then. Think of something you can do in the next 24, 48, maybe 72 hours to thicken that line. And then do it, write it on that map, give yourself a timeline to do it by, and then do it. Um, and this is a really simple, almost too simple to think it's worthwhile. But trust me, if we go through this process once every couple of months, just looking at our support network, not only do we strengthen it, the other thing we can end up doing is identifying people who maybe are slowly disengaging and might need our support. So Steve, I can see you've got yours there. Any lines that you want to thicken? Yeah, so I mean, for me, I'm just thinking from a from a purely work point of view, and and I've recently had a new boss, so we don't know each other as well as 
Um, we might have, and, and COVID hasn't hasn't helped. So for me, you know, really, what I need to do is is to seize the opportunity to clarify um, kind of what I do for him, but what I need from him um, in terms of help, support, and and you know, having that kind of keeping an eye on me and and how things are going. Perfect. Sounds sounds entirely reasonable and um, and worthwhile um, energy investment to me. Now, 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 can I just clarify if the line to my wife could could I <laughs> argue that I need to thin the line to go to the pub with the lads in order to improve my support network? If I if I said that you said that, would it be okay? <laughs> I was just about to say, as long as I'm not indicted in the argument. <laughs> <laughs> huh? an unnamed professional told me that <laughs> we are stretching it with professional steve but we'll we'll <laughs> the unnamed will work yeah so hopefully people have, have had a chance to do that if anyone has got any comments having done it please feed feed them in if it's cause any light bulb moments possibly um you know uh, i certainly find for myself that sometimes when i draw things out or put them to paper you you have a real moment of clarity when you 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 see it in that format um absolutely there's there's another thing here as well which anyone who's uh, either got children of their own or nieces nephews or works with with um, our younger generation um, a huge amount of um, all of our, but certainly Gen Z, you know, that generation that turned 20 last year and will turn 20 for the next nine years, and the younger generation, you know, key stage four, three, even down to key stage two in schools, key stage one maybe even, a huge amount of their social interaction is digital. Um, there are a whole load of problems that we haven't got time to talk about there, but there are also a whole load of opportunities with that. Um, but nevertheless, it does mean that a lot of the interaction of the younger generation and Gen Z um, is not face to face. It's face to screen. Um, and when we're investing in a support network, someone who will drop everything to come and help us or provide structured support in whatever way we need it, that really needs to be human contact. Now, it may not be able to be face to face, especially not even until we get the full restrictions lifted but a human voice to a human voice. And if we can do it you know, via a video chat, great. If we can meet up in person, brilliant. But it's always gonna be the strongest. But um, I would just say that that particular exercise um, can be quite startling for some of the younger generation when you ask them to map their support network because they, they can sometimes struggle to identify who they would put on there. And of course, that means that that's a really worthwhile exercise. They need to spend time helping them to think about that and what they need to do to, to strengthen their support networks. Yeah. That um, ties in quite nicely with another question from, from Joe, um, which is how can we check the strength of our support network? Or can we check it? Um, you will have a feeling, you know, you've those people who've just done this exercise you know it's that's a subjective you know assessment that you've you've done when you've put the thickness of the lines in so you will have a feeling if you honestly think about in elements of your support network and think how strong is my my relationship with them your first instinct will be 90 percent correct will, will be 90 percent correct as far as testing i would suggest we don't test it we just seek to keep building it because the process of building it will give you more of a yardstick of how, how well that particular element is functioning. So I would never seek to test it for testing's sake. But what I would do is say, right, OK, I'm going to do something to help build my relationship with this element of my support network. Not only will it build it, but it would also, if I'm unsure as to how strong that is, the interaction I have building it will help me understand how strong it is as well. Excellent. So um, if you're happy, uh, Dean, we've got three really kind of good questions here that have got some meat in them um, that might 
might help to to uh, bring this all, all together if you're happy with that. Yeah, of course, please. Yeah. So the first one is when I'm feeling low and unable to deal with stuff, it can be really hard to share how you feel with other people. Do you have any tips for dealing with this? Yeah, I mean, this is this is absolutely normal. You know, we shouldn't feel bad about this. And in fact, some of the some of the coping mechanisms we give to people, we say, you know, don't be scared of wanting some wallow time. You know, if you're feeling bad and you're feeling down, um, positive psychology doesn't say you have to have an immediate response. In fact, positive psychology says that something that is often required is wallow time time to actually just process that and say this is not great this doesn't feel great but at the moment i just need to to process this experience it's called wallow time because of the, the idea of a hippo in the mud you know a hippo goes into the mud to escape the searing sun because it's just it can't get anything done in that in that hot sun so it goes into the mud to cool off but the hippo knows two things one it can't stay still in the mud because it will get air locked into the mud the thick mud at the bottom and the mud will crust at the top so even when it's wallowing and feeling a bit, you know, or a bit sorry for itself, it still slowly moves. And the second thing the hippo knows is it alone is responsible for extracting itself from the mud eventually. So it, it has to, you know, find a way out. Um, the other thing I would say this question really refers to is um, understanding that own it um, is not just about being able to cope. It's equally, if not more, about being able to ask for help, okay? Um, the strength in stoicism can be misplaced if we, if we take stoicism to its, to its, you know, nth degree. Um, and it, it can be dangerous, can be very dangerous. So it's that belief that actually asking for help, showing vulnerability is a real example of, of, of owning it. As regards other tips for how to share it, um, there's two, two schools of thought here. The first school of thought is find the person you want to share it with and then don't delay, just start saying something. Because as soon as you start talking, you've got to finish talking, okay? And they will know. So just force yourself to start talking, okay? The second thing is, um, making sure that the people that you're going to you know that they've got the time for you so you can you can tee them up in front you can say i want to talk to you um when would you have time so that you, you've they already know they're expecting something this is a bit like i want to go for a run tomorrow morning so i'll get my trainers and my kit out and i'll sleep in my running kit i've already laid the foundation for going for a run i'm more likely to do it if we say to someone, would you have time to talk to me? We're not, it's not, we're not having to be fully brave to say what we need help with, but we're at the same time, we're creating the condition by which they're gonna come back to us and say, right, yeah, so talk to me, okay? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say all of those things listed above, really. Fantastic, Dino. And you know how important is it that within our group we're all kind of looking at each other and supporting each other how important is that yeah um essential so i mean you and i have spoken previously about various metaphors for this and one of them we look at is the spartan shield um, and we love this story. We particularly love using this story in schools. Um, the Spartans, I'd, I wouldn't advocate all of Spartan uh, culture. They were, they were quite a brutal race. But th there is a lot to be learned from the iconic status they placed on the shield and the reason why. So the Spartan shield, known as the Aspis, was an icon of Spartan culture because not only was every boy taught to use the shield as the primary method of protection from when they started the Agoji, the Spartan training system, age eight, all the way through to completion age 19. But as well as protection of the, the individual, the Spartan shield slotted into the protective line known as the phalanx. So the Spartans were the first 
two and a half thousand years ago to invent this overlapping shield formation, what's called a fish scale overlap, whereby when they when they had to form as a line, they overlapped these three foot diameter shields by about six inches on each side. What that achieved in terms of creating the strength of the line was phenomenal. And it's still used today, slightly different interlocking mechanisms for riot police shields, military shields, etc. police shields. But the principle is the same. By interlocking your shield with the person to your right, the person to your left, any blow to your shield, 90% of the impact doesn't come back to you. It pivots on the shield to one side, which then causes it to pivot into the shield to the other side. And 90% of the force gets disseminated off down the line. So if we're investing in our support networks, if we're metaphorically overlapping shields, then anytime we get a blow, our support network helps us absorb it. It's there. It takes that absorption of that blow with us. Okay. And, and it's remarkably similar to to the Spartan shield, the Spartan soldiers in a phalanx line. Um, so essential is the answer. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, uh, yeah. Nice use of metaphor there. So I'll just, uh, I'll tie two questions together to, to get us uh, the last one. So um, what are the common mistakes people make when trying to establish this positive positive mental health system and therefore what are the best ways of continuing to learn progress and grow after this event okay so the two most common mistakes are thinking that information is transformation it's not if you think standing outside a gym looking through the glass window at the equipment inside is going to make your muscles bigger you are sorely mistaken the size of your muscles is not, they're not going to get bigger. If anything, they would atrophy. <laughs> so information is not transformation. Um, we know for through positive psychology research that all of these strategies, box breathing, gratitudes, um, spin recovery, um, support networks, investment support, we know they work if you put them into practice. You can choose to prove they work. You can equally choose to prove they don't work for you by not engaging with them. So biggest mistake is not, not engaging with the principles. The second mistake is um, giving up, um, but not intentionally giving up, just it falling by the wayside. And the reason these, these um, techniques, strategies fall by the wayside is we haven't built them into routine. Um, if you want to do a box breathing session as part of every kickoff meeting in the office on a Monday, make it a, an item in the standing agenda. It has to be put into routine so that it, it, it's there, it's going to happen. And the same in your personal life as well. Make it routine in the same way you brush your teeth, two minutes of box breathing. That gives you two breathing sessions a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. As for the, the second part of the question, what's the best way to sustain our learning and progress after this? The best way to sustain your engagement with positive mental health is tell people. If we if we decide we're gonna do a 10K run um, and we don't tell anyone, it's very easy to drop out of doing that 10K run. If we decide to do a 10K run and we tell our entire support network, they will keep checking on us, see how we're doing, see how the training's going. So if you're committing to positive mental health, tell people, use it as part of your engagement with your support network. Um, and sustain our learning, um, then go to some of the reference material that we've talked about. Come to our website at Front of Mind. We have we have guides for um, podcasts you can listen to, guides for books that you can download. Um, but take ownership, you know, take ownership and, and seek, where do I want to take this? I'm particularly interested in this field here of positive mental health and go and learn more about it. Fantastic. Thank you, Dean. And, and just a reminder again to everyone that these uh, talks are on the uh, CMI archive. They're out on YouTube. So if you've heard something today that you want to revisit, please go back. Or if you're just coming in um, at the end of the, the process, then please, they're all available for you there. 
um, for you to go and engage with and learn a little bit more about what we've been talking about. Um, so just very briefly, um, Dino, if you can remind us what this series has been all about. Yeah, absolutely. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to the CMI um, for, for engaging with this. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in and listened to this and been part of it live and has watched the videos later. Um, Front of Mind is a positive mental health series taken from the insights of the research field of positive psychology. The program seeks to help people take ownership of their mental health by understanding that it's not what happens to us, it's the way we choose to process that and respond. Based on that ownership, we can then engage in techniques and strategies to be it. So we can build breathing techniques, meditation techniques, exercise, engaging with nature, gratitudes, conscious acts of kindness, the list goes on. We can choose one or two that work for us and build them into the routines of our lives to become it and also how to respond when we face challenge. And then finally, having done this, don't let's hold that information and that benefit to ourselves. Let's share it with others because we feel good for doing it. They feel they get the benefit of receiving it and our relationship gets strengthened by it. So own it, be it, share it. Fantastic. So for everyone, thank you very much for joining us, particularly if you've joined throughout the series. Um, just a reminder that we have a very interesting talk with Magda Flores coming up on uh, the effect of urban planning on positive mental health. We've then got Sarah Finesse um, coming to talk about the use of mindfulness and its advantages within the business setting. And then Kev Beresford in September uh, talking about mental health first aid. So tying all this together. What I would like to do, though, is to once again thank um Dean Bellman uh, of Front of Mind and Value Behaviours for the amount of effort that he's put into this and for the benefit that he's brought to, um, you know, myself certainly listening in and the thousands of people who've, who've um, joined us either online on the night or through catch up. So, um, Dean, on behalf of the CMI, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure and good luck, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dean, as Steve's mentioned. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. If you are a member of CMI, you can log into Management Direct using the link in the live chat. And if you're not yet a CMI member, why not join our community as well as um, the sorry, the link is also in the live chat as well. Um, plus, via the link in the live chat, you can also visit the CMI East CMI South East Regional Board webpage, and there you can join their LinkedIn group. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>